Hey guys, today I want to talk about Irina Ratushinskaya's memoir, Gray is the Color of Hope. So, until relatively recently, I've kind of avoided literature from the 20th century having to do with political repression and human exile, and to a lesser extent, human rights. And really, just sort of literature having to do with 20th century politics in general. And so I had to ask myself why it was that I've sort of not sought out this this whole body of literature as much as I probably should. And the only answer I could come up with really kind of disturbed me, which was that it's really just kind of difficult to confront this type of literature as a reader because it makes me feel uncomfortable. And that's disturbing because that's pretty obviously a horrible reason for avoiding anything and a completely pathetic reason for avoiding Books. I don't mean to suggest that I think that good books should make you feel uncomfortable, but I think I would like to suggest that as readers we should kind of open the doors to as much discomfort as is necessary to begin to understand the world from someone else's point of view. So what is it about books about political repression that make them kind of difficult for a reader like myself to approach. And the answer to that I think is pretty straightforward. It's just that books like this cause us to confront the fact that we may take some very basic human rights that we enjoy for granted. And in that we have to kind of reconcile the fact that the only reason we might enjoy um, these things that we consider to be very basic human rights is a result of the fact of when, where, to whom and in what bodies we were born. So I've never had to fight for my right to get a basic education or to learn how to read or to get a job or to vote or to enter a public building or to openly discuss, write about, and form an opinion about human issues and share them with people. So these are all things which I simply take for granted and there are also things that countless millions of people have had to suffer for throughout history and into the present day. When confronted with very real cases of this repression, it's uncomfortable. And I think that it probably should be uncomfortable because it forces us to think about the fact that we might occasionally take these liberties that we have for granted. And it's extremely obvious that I shouldn't avoid some insignificant amount of discomfort at the expense of forgetting the fact that there are millions of people who have had to suffer and fight for these things. As a side note, a novel that sort of opened my eyes a little bit to this type of literature was Arthur Kessler's Darkness at Noon, um, which is an absolutely fantastic novel. And although it's also a prison narrative, it's kind of it's, it's quite a bit different than uh, Ratushinskaya's um, actual memoir. Irina Borisovna Ratushinskaya was born in Odessa in the former Soviet Ukraine in 1954. In 1983, when she was just 29 years old, she was sentenced to serve seven years in a Soviet labor camp as a result of having written poetry which expressed, quote, anti-Soviet agitation and propaganda. Her memoir is a memoir of basically the three and a half years that she ultimately served of that sentence. And so throughout the memoir she describes the extremely dismal living conditions of the time spent mainly in this area called the small zone which was sort of this fenced off area that she shared with between I believe five and ten other political prisoners, um, other women at the time. She writes about the physical and emotional toll of frequent sentencing to solitary confinement and hunger strikes which she and the other women orchestrated regularly as a measure of solidarity basically to fight for very basic privileges which could get revoked at any given time. One of the things that was particularly compelling to me about this memoir was Ratushinskaya's conviction to her principles and sort of the way that she frames all of her voluntary actions in terms of these, these core principles that she believes in. So for example, the women are assigned to this sort of work duty of sewing 
um, workman's gloves. And Ratushinskaya states that basically they do first class work, you know, they turn out these first class gloves. Um, and they do it as a sort of a matter of pride because it's good work and that the effort they put into sewing up these gloves is going to um, benefit someone else down the line. She says when we work, we really work. We turn out first class gloves as a point of honor. We do not sabotage the equipment and see nothing demeaning in our job. The gloves produced by us are used by workers on building sites and not by our persecutors. She also talks about the sort of personality of the um, officer who oversees their, their working operation and um, she actually really respects this guy because in some sense he kind of sympathizes with the women and um, is just basically a decent human being to them and so she, she respects this. And in fact this recognition of the individual as something distinct from the class or system that the individual might represent is um, another really powerful theme throughout this memoir. This is reflected again actually in a scene where the women have been tending to this illegal vegetable garden that they've planted and it's not permitted by the prison officials and yet sort of the officers on duty have been kind of turning a blind eye to it while they work on it. And there's a scene in which uh, the women, uh, some of the women have kind of been refusing to wear these identity tags, which is one of the main points of tension between the prisoners and the officials throughout the memoir, which I'll come back to in just a minute. And so anyway, they're going to destroy this garden that the women have kind of really worked extremely hard at building. And as they go through the process of tearing it up, um, it's actually kind of a really depressing scene. And nonetheless, Rotution Sky sort of recognizes in the faces of the guards who are, who are watching this ordeal unfold, sort of the pain in their faces and how they think that it's it's such a shame that um, such a beautiful thing is being torn up for um, you know no reason at all. So she says they start, the vegetables are stuffed into bags, the plants are reduced to a pulp with hose, green spray flies in all directions, the soil of the beds is turned over thoroughly to ensure that no stray root is left behind. Potus fusses around, issuing orders and instructions. Everyone else is silent. The women prisoners are obviously ill at ease, but they can hardly disobey her command. She's the big wheel. The warders take no part, but stand there stiffly, occasionally shaking their heads. They are sorry about the wanton destruction of our vegetable patch, because they are all keen gardeners themselves, and know how difficult it is to grow anything in sandy soil. They had always treated our efforts at gardening with great respect, and frequently came to Raya for advice, or for seeds which are not obtainable in Mordovia. In exchange, they would secretly slip us seeds, too, for such things as carrots and turnips. They were particularly impressed by an enormous pumpkin which had managed to grow, which we had managed to grow. It was really huge, and its shoots and leaves kept pushing through the forbidden perimeter zone. The warders patrolling it would carefully push this daring greenery back into our zone, although there was nothing to stop them from trampling all over it. All they did was laugh. That's some pumpkin you've got there. It looks like it's planning to break out. You keep an eye on it so it doesn't escape. This pumpkin was pulled up to roots and all and thrown into one of the bags. So throughout the memoir she she discusses a lot of the events which directly challenge her to confront her principles. And in one instance she actually risks forfeiting the opportunity to meet with her husband for simply refusing to wear these identification tags. So in this passage she's she's contemplating this decision. My dearest love, will you find it in your heart to forgive me for placing our possible meeting under threat? You know that I cannot do otherwise, that I dare not jump even once over this prison rod at their command. What would you do in my place? Did we not once promise each other that in the case of arrest we would not let them use either of us as a tool to blackmail the other? So I say firmly, no, I won't wear the identity tag. Oh, how hard it is at times to do what one must, and paradoxically, how easy it is too. Would I have been happier if I had donned the identity tag? Please, POTUS had a meeting and retained access to the kiosk, and then, burning with shame, watched Tatiana Mikhailovna going off for a spell in Shizo because she wears no identity tag, and I do. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, that tag would have been a burning coal against my breast. Shizo in that scene is 
the acronym for the solitary confinement cell at the camp, which the women find themselves in regularly as a result of doing things like refusing to wear these identification tags. Another compelling aspect to this story was learning about the way that these women constructed this tight-knit community amongst themselves in spite of this repressive environment that they lived in. It seemed like it was really strengthened by rituals like making a big deal out of celebrating birthdays for each of the women and for things like celebrating various religious holidays that women from different uh, religious denominations observed and really just the way that the women tried to sort of humanize their condition um, throughout their stay. There's a scene where um, they sort of set the tables up outside and are eating their extremely small rationed portions of dinner at this table where they set wildflowers that they've pulled and are trying their best to just kind of have this pleasant communal meal and Ratushin's guy notes that how much it just absolutely infuriates um, some of the officers who are in, in charge of basically keeping them captive. But one of the things that really was most striking to me about this memoir was the way that Ratushinskaya's personality, and in particular her sense of humor, came through. Um, I mean, she seems like just such an incredibly strong, principled woman who can somehow have a sense of humor about things in the most, you know, desperate, horrible, depressing situations. There are countless examples of it throughout the book. I think on the first few pages she kind of jokes about being treated like a queen because she's sort of being escorted from room to room in this courthouse and how doors are being opened for her by um, minions. And so despite the fact that she is hungry, emotionally exhausted, physically weak, she maintains this outward sense of being undefeated. In general it's interesting to kind of think about how her sense of humor plays some role in the spiritual survival of her and the other women in this community. I found Grey's The Color of Hope to be an extremely powerful memoir and one that I've been thinking about every day as I've been reading it and um, I'll probably be thinking about it for a long time. So I highly recommend picking up a copy at your local library if you can find it. Otherwise I'll post a link to where you might be able to find it in the description below. You know, something that I'll mention that I thought about, so I picked this copy up from the library here, and I've been using this old card that I found in it as sort of a, um, a bookmark, and I see that it was some required reading for a class called Lit 234. And I can't help but wonder if books like this in particular, but really just good literature in general, are more and more relegated to the realm of academia. Personally, I think it would be kind of upsetting if the discussion surrounding this type of literature and, and great books in general um, were contained only in classrooms and not being had out in the real world. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks for watching. If you've got recommendations for other books that I should be reading, leave them in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.